All right, embodied interaction, lecture four, socially situated practices. Um, so I'm today I'm going to try and explain something that is um, not very straightforward, especially if you come from computer science and you are so used to thinking in terms of models and representations as being kind of the tools you use to represent the world that you want to understand, which is what scientists do in general, right? We create models to understand and, and theories to understand the world. Now we're going to sort of step back and think about how, how these models themselves play a role in the practices of people like for example scientists or computer scientists and computer modelers but also in everyday life so whenever we draw something on uh, a blackboard and we use that to talk to another person to uh, explain something and to uh, create a shared understanding uh, we are using external representations within a social setting Right, so we've talked in a previous lecture a lot about external representation, but we have sort of not looked at the social context within which people are using external representations. We just took that for granted or it, we, we assumed it was not important, but it is very important and it, it adds another layer to this whole idea of embodied interaction, uh, which I want to focus on today. So we're not just looking at, at external representation, we're first going to look at the social situation within which, at some point, people start using representations. But what is this social situation that was already there? What is happening already there? Now, if you uh, compare this to the, the sort of the thinking model or the thinking frame that we've been looking at so far, so far, everything to do with external representations was still focused on linking one human being, maybe multiple human beings, but in, in, in principle, one user, linking one user to digital information through uh, a good interface, right? So the idea was to create an interaction, an interface, and then we had a whole discussion on whether a tangible inter interface would um, create different kinds of user qualities and experiences than a graphical inter interface, for example, right? But still the whole setting of it was a user, digital system, interface. Now, if we, if we zoom out from that and say, we're not going to look at human computer interaction as such, but we're actually going to look at what is the sort of the setting and the context that this, this is playing out in, right? So where is this person? What, what kind of world is this person living in? that is using a system. Now I took as an example the thermostat. So for example, if a person is working on a thermostat in, uh, in order to get, a, get information about uh, the temperature in the room from the digital system, uh, we're just talking about the interface, right? So what, is a, what would be a good thermostat interface to, um, to make sure that the person can easily read off the temperature? Uh, so suppose this, suppose this person is part of a family and in the family there's four people and there's all kinds of tools and things they use in their in their home environment, and one of these things is the thermostat. Now the question is, what is this thermostat doing as a whole within this situation? And what the thermostat is doing, uh, I would like to say, it's actually negotiating the notion of comfort. So every one of those four people has an idea about what would be a good temperature, but of course it's not literally about the temperature, it's about do you feel okay in the room or do you not feel okay? Is the climate okay for you or not? And if you think, oh, it's chilly, you might say, oh, it's chilly. And then another person says, so what temperature is it? And then you walk to the thermostat, you look at the screen and you say, well, yeah, it's, it's 90 degrees. And then another person says, well, let's put it on 20. And then another person would say, 20, 20 degrees Celsius I'm talking about, right? That's, that's too much. Uh, that's nonsense. 19 is fine. Well, I, I still think it's chilly, whether or not it's 19 or... I mean, those discussions, we've all had those discussions, right? Um, so, um, 
in that case, the, the sense making, so that the way these people are making sense of the situation and how they get to their actions, like how what, do they finally press the button and make it 20? Or do they say, well, okay, we'll keep it at 19. I'm going to just take a, uh, find a sweater in the cupboard. Now, what kind of decisions they make, what kind of actions they do, and how that relates to how they together make sense of the situation, this is mediated by the object. So the way the information is presented and the, the, the feedback that the digital system can give to this family is contributing in some way, not in a straightforward way, but it's contributing in some way in the way that they make sense of it together. It helps in the, it becomes an object through which these four people are making sense of, is this room the correct kind of comfort that we need or do we need to change something? Now I want to show you this video and uh, I will first show you the video and then afterwards I will uh, explain a bit. Dit is meer hoenpapa, hè? Ja. Uh, dit is hoenpapa. Ik was even schoenen. Dit is hoenpapa, echt Nederlandstalig. Bijna zeker. Dit is Guus Meeuws, Guus Meeuws. Nee, dat was het van het begin al mee gezongen. Hij zei het Nederlands. Nee. Dit moet ik een Nederlandstalige denk ik. Nee, nee, nee. Dit is toch niet aan? So what you see here in the video is um, a group of people who are outside of a situation and because of the headphones and the artificial nature of this uh, game, if you wish, um, it's very clear and explicit. Uh, it, it's, it's very tangible and physicalized that they are outside of a situation and all the people wearing the headphones are inside something. They are together, right? They are a group. And they understand what is going on and they belong to this group. And of course, this is a very artificial, special kind of situation. But the idea of this movie is to show that actually we are, this is going on all the time. We are all the time, we are in situations, but you can't really see that or feel that. It's very um, fluid and, and very um, uh, unconscious, so to speak. So you're in a situation, but then there are these points, these moments at which you suddenly think, oh, wait a minute. So, for, for example, uh, you walk into a, a room and then it, you find out there is a party and you were not invited. Uh, that can happen for real, right? So you walk in and then after a while you start to think, oh, wait a minute. I'm, this, this, I, I'm not supposed to be here at all. Uh, Goffman actually talks about that in the in the chapter that we're reading that and also how you should behave uh, so in so in the old days there were all kinds of rules that if you would walk into a, somebody's house and you wouldn't were not invited you shouldn't uh, shout out oh i wasn't invited you should just uh, mingle and walk around and then quietly go away so so as not to disturb the situation right so um the idea is that People move in and out of situations all the time. Situations are not something that you can clearly demarcate. There's not a clear boundary around it. As in this movie, it's very, very physical and clear, but normally it's very subtle. You go into a situation and once you're in the situation, the people there sort of have a shared common understanding and they're also constantly working on a common understanding of what is going on. They're sort of together making sure that the situation stays alive and, and, and unfolds in, in a certain meaningful way. Goffman calls it, uh, uh, has a definition of situation. He says the, the full spatial environment, so it's, it's physical in the sense that it's, it's somewhere, uh, anywhere within which an entering person becomes a member of the gathering, um, becomes a member of the gathering. Okay, we continue now um, with another movie just to get a flavor of the whole idea of what is situatedness and what is what does it mean for people to make sense in the situation of what is going on. <clears throat> uh, this is an example from a workshop that I once did and it's a bunch of designers uh, working together uh, trying to come up with a new idea. Um, 
it doesn't matter what the idea is really about and also you don't get it from the video what it is really that they're talking about um, but that's sort of the point of it like what you do see is that they definitely have a sense of what they're talking about and they're figuring it out together as they go and they're figuring it out working with the physical materials that they have in their hands and looking at what other people are doing with the physical materials they have in their hand. So, I mean, if I, yeah. Or maybe it's, you know? So we're trying to get this over here and this I, over just, there? Just try it because it's, it's even the process of kind of doing it. Kind of. Oh, that's clean. Yeah, but it, think about if we fix them parallel Together. And then the only movement is this. This distance is like... <laughs> mm -hmm. Look, he, so what, he, these are walking against the gravity. They're all like floating, floating mm -hmm. in the middle of the air. But if I do this, they mm -hmm. just fall off. So maybe what we're looking at is not this, because this is too rigid. But this kind of... Ooh, look at that. <laughs> idea. All right. Now the other place. Where did you get that blue cut? <laughs> <laughs> And so now if we make a whole train track of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is DNA. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> right, so, so it's not as if they already had a full-fledged symbolic idea in their minds and then they, they executed that idea and gave it physical form with their hands, which would be sort of the traditional idea uh, of cognitive science. Uh, no, it's the other way around. They figure out stuff in the social dialogue, in the in the in the interaction between them, which is very embodied and and very physically there with their hands, trying out stuff and and pointing at things. And you also hear this one guy in the red shirt saying all the time things like, "What about this and this and there?" And they and the girl says, "Oh, look, they are doing this." So they don't have to use all kinds of content words because the objects they have in their hands, they are the contents right there. So they don't have to have sort of mental, they don't have to negotiate mental things between them because there's physical stuff that is sort of used as a mediating object so that they can understand one another and they can collaboratively understand the idea. Then all the way in the end, they fix it with a name. They say, it's DNA, right? And at the moment, it's it, and then they laugh, and then they got it. But th that's, that's sort of the final piece that closes the whole process, right? Like the, the final stone that, that completes the arc uh, in old-fashioned architecture uh, buildings. The closing, the closing stone, we call it in Dutch. Um, the understanding that is shared between them is already there right before uh, as, uh, the girl finishes it off by calling it DNA. Now, and this is what we call the situatedness of human activity. And if you do ethnography, then uh, the purpose and the outcome of ethnographic work, as Paul Dorish says, is to see that how we organize stuff in the, in, the, in the real world, how we collaboratively solve problems, is always something that is settinged or occasioned or situated. In other words, as he says, the actual moment-to-moment -moment organization of work is contingent on the setting in which it emerges. A lot of interesting work came from the early days of HCI, where uh, physical workplaces were being digitalized. And what you saw in those workplaces is that things would actually, uh, a lot of things went wrong. And this is a famous example of flight uh, air traffic controllers. And these air traffic controllers, they use things called, called flight strips, and you see them here. And on these flight strips, people would write with a pen uh, the states, uh, the current status of certain airplanes like whether they're still in the air, uh, whether they're preparing for landing, landing, uh, uh, taxiing to the gate, and so on and so forth. And so all of that was organized with this flight strip system. 
<clears throat> now when they started to digitalize it and here you can already see in this picture that it's partly digitalized there is already a screen here um, the, the computer scientists thought well <clears throat> we're just going to put uh, the physical uh, information on, on a digital screen and have the same kind of structure and then it works and then it found out they found out that it actually doesn't work at all and the reason it doesn't work is that these physical flight strips were publicly publicly available to all people there in the room and it turned out that the people were sort of without having very explicit rules for this they were using these physical objects to uh, organize the work together so to make a very explicit example what you could have is that somebody would put a flight strip uh, not as it should be in the box but but perpendicular to it so stick it in so that it would stick out and then do something else and then everybody would know that there was something important that still needed to be done with this particular plane but that there was an emergency why somebody had to go to another place and do something else or maybe go to the toilet even and then somebody else would say hey john um is this your flight strip yeah that's mine i'm gonna do that later or uh shall i pick that up uh yeah no wait um, i've got it i just need to finish this task and then so they were managing the work together uh, and also finding out what needs to be done and what's already done um, you know all this external representation stuff but in a in a social setting by using these physical objects and what you could do with physical objects and you couldn't do that with stuff on the screen you couldn't take out a flight strip and put it stick it out of your screen for a moment to to remember something right so just like uh, making a knot in your handkerchief or, or putting a, a, a sticky note on the fridge that kind of stuff you couldn't do on the screen so um, uh, suddenly the whole system broke down and that's what they found out in these studies uh, famous studies on the on the air flight strip controller system so what Paul Doris is saying this is more than just using strips to represent the state of the airspace right because that got represented in the digital system all right but it's the work of managing the space becomes the embodied performance of physical activity arising around the specific details of the work site itself and Lucy Suchman for example said representations like flight, flight strips they are external representations right but they orient ourselves in a way that will allow us through local interactions to exploit some contingencies of the environment and avoid others and this is a very complex way of saying we use physical things to be able to improvise right so so you put stuff out there in the world that constrains our actions but in it, and it guides our attention but once we get going we simply just do what comes natural at that moment we 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 uh, we solve the problem in a more improvised way and if you're in a digital system where you have to fill in boxes one by one like filling in a text form online there's no space for improvisation right you can you often cannot change the order of in which you do things you cannot uh, stop and and first do something else and then return and so on so all of that is not possible with digital systems that are much more uh, restrictive um, and with physical objects you have much more space like it's helping you guide your guide you in your task but it also gives you a lot of freedom to still sort of play around with it so that's that now um, what Goffman says at some point in the chapter that I think is, is interesting is that um, when we are physically present in the same room like these air traffic controllers we are able to see what another person is doing with stuff and that makes it easy for us to make sense of what what is going on if I see you do something and I see that you have a problem or that you're solving it I, I can easily and uh, more easily find out if we are together doing all right right if, 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 if the whole project is going in the right direction um, but also another person can also see that I'm seeing you right so we both see each other watching each other and that's a very special thing so um, each giver is himself a receiver and each receiver is a giver and of course himself herself themselves uh, it's an old text okay so now I want to in, in I have sort of introduced the whole idea but I want to uh, go in a few sort of reasoning or thinking steps sort of scaffold stepping stones I want to take you from the straightforward idea of external representation which we talked about in the last lecture 
to the idea of um, situated practices. So the, the basic approach here is that we're doing ethnographic description of human practices in the wild. So we're looking at what people are actually doing in real world practices. We're looking at, at people in the full richness with everything uh, there as it is in the real world. And what we see there is that people very often, almost often, solve problems together. Right? So if you think about the, the people that work on a Navy ship, uh, how is this ship being steered, navigated? Uh, well, it's navigated as a whole system of people working together, almost like an anthill. Now, considering that people solve problems together, we use technology in a social context. So we're being social in a, in a yeah, solving the problem together, and we use things, tools, maps, graphs, drawings, um, a measurement instruments, uh, what have you. But it is more to say that when we when we use these technologies, um, it's more to say that just oh, when you use a technology, the social context is important. It's more than that. Um, uh, we have to focus on what we call situated activity. So this means that people's behavior is inherently social. If I use the thermostat, I'm not just wanting to get the temperature right, I also am doing that in the context of knowing that another person may find it not cold enough and that saying that it's cold, like looking at the thermostat and saying, hey, it's cold, is a social statement. It's saying, it's, it's, it's making a statement knowing somewhere, sort of unconsciously, that somebody else could maybe disagree. And so it's more like the starting point of a negotiation, like what do we actually together think of the, the temperature in this room? Now, this means that whatever we perceive and whatever we uh, think about is only understandable for us, intelligible for us, as seen against some kind of common sense background. There's always already a whole practice, a sort of a whole social referential frame that we have been grown up in from, from child to, to adult, uh, through which we look at the world. Right? So when you see a chair in Western society, uh, it's a certain, it's so familiar and normal and uh, you, don't, you don't think about a chair anymore. But there is a whole meaning in it that is, to uh, some extent, socially determined. There are still cultures in the world, big cultures, like for instance in India, many people, uh, especially in the rural areas, they don't sit on chairs. So if they look at a chair, they see something else than what I would see if I look at a chair, because I've been grown up with chairs as the normal thing that you sit on. So we cannot just say that's the physical properties of the chair that give me the sense of, oh, this is the thing to sit on. It's also a social thing, right? If, you, if, you, if, if, if a chair is not something that you usually sit on, then seeing a chair is a sort of a special event or, yeah, it, or, or it's something that you then have to decide, am I going to sit on it or I'm going to sit next to it or I'm going to stand on it? Right. This also you see this in this the the in the Western world we always laugh a little bit when we see these pictures now in the toilets that you should not uh, sit you should not uh, stand with your feet on the toilet ring, right? And we think oh, why is this? You you see on social media this picture. Oh, oh, oh look what I just found in the toilet. What what is what is this strange crazy stuff? But this is purely because we have been grown up in a culture in the western world to see a toilet in a certain way to perceive it in a certain way as normal and that's why we find the picture weird but um, the people who've put the pictures there they know that apparently there's a lot of people that don't find it normal right and and we shouldn't judge that it's just this is this is just because we grow up in a certain social cultural context and it's not just to have to do with with countries and and cultures in the with a high capital c this is true for everything. So if I enter a student home right now, being in my 40s, I would probably think, oh my God, how people are able to live here. But 
most students would think well what is wrong with this space this is a good space i i'm, I'm happy here right and and so it even changes because i was once a student and when i was in a student home my parents would come in and say oh my god how can you live in this space so right so so it's very local and as they say contingent on the local circumstances how you perceive your environment now given all that the next step is that um this this whole local stuff people being together making sense of things this develops into what we call a practice and a practice is uh, has a certain know-how so there's knowledge in the practice but this knowledge is not sort of formally written down anywhere it's not in a textbook it's not in a procedure this is knowledge that people that are in the practice they they keep it alive so to speak and they keep it alive not by thinking about it in their heads all the time they keep it alive by doing it they as they say they enact the knowledge so by doing things a certain way all the time and by looking at other people doing it and then by copying what other people are doing and then sort of doing it as we all do right so you so you're in a practice and you think oh this is how you should do things here and you learn it by by looking at other people and you start doing it the same way as well gradually uh, you become a member of the of the practice of the community and the whole thing gets sustained over time so there's sort of a memory in a practice but the memory is not in everybody's heads the memory is in the fact that we all are keep on doing this stuff it's, it's sort of kept alive in in the world and not in our minds and and certainly not in a in a textbook or a rule book now knowing how to do things within a practice means you are a member of that practice a member of the community of practice this is what the john Lave said um, developing an identity as a member of a community and becoming knowledgeably skillful are part of the same process with the former motivating shaping and giving meaning to the later which it subsumes now this is a nice quote to think about next now you get the funny thing suppose we have a practice so we have a group of people collaboratively making sense of stuff they have tools they have things and they have found a way of doing things found a way of making sense found a way of solving problems together and it works and they do it again and again and there's younger people coming into the practice learning from the elder people and so well you could say well sort of a little knowledge culture there has emerged right and it doesn't matter what it's about right? Pff, I don't know cooking uh, uh, whatever at some point people start to create as part of the artifact. So in the artifacts, you could have a tool like a hammer. But of course, if you're, if you're carpenting, then you could have a hammer and a, and a screwdriver. But at some point you could also say, I'm taking a pencil and a piece of paper and I'm starting to, to, to write down what I'm doing. Or I will try, start to sketch what I'm doing. So I'm making a representation of my practice. A representation of part of my practice at least that helps me do the practice better so this means this is the first time that you would sort of step out of what you're doing you're no longer just going along with the flow and, and copying other people's stuff you're stepping out of the situatedness and you're making a separate thing that is sort of a map or a model of the thing that you're doing and that's a very important step animals don't do this this is really only human beings who do this as far as i know never seen any example of an animal doing this it's distinctive of human beings so lucy lucy suchman had in the 1980s already a book called plans and situated actions which was her phd work and actually one of her thesis supervisors was hubert dreyfus of whom about whom we're gonna watch a great movie being in the world he was a phenomenologist who was a heidegger scholar and lucy suchman brought together phenomenology on the one hand uh, which we're going to talk about later in the course and on the other hand um ethnography but not not just ethnography but what she called it ethnomethodology uh based on garfinkel who was her main uh, main inspiration in this this project and this was studying sort of the way 
people create order in such situated practices but with the explicit critical attitude that this order was not kind of a, a mental mental program that would be in your brain or and it was also not like a, like a social order that society would sort of um, uh, put on us from from above that there would be some kind of abstract higher level of societal rules that people fall into no this was an order that emerged out of the activities of people themselves so if people start to work together they create a kind of orderly sense making in action and this was situated practice um, and and she analyzed interestingly enough people who were working on a Xerox copy machine because her PhD was with uh, uh, Xerox Park, the re famous research institute that, that produced a lot of famous things for, for human computer interaction. And I imagine that her original uh, uh, assignment would have been to, to, to study copy machines so that, that they could make a better copy machine, right? But, but her whole, so what, uh, like, like a basic usability she could have taken it up as a phd student and, made, and done a, uh, a, a modest uh, standard usability study trying to improve the copy machines buttons or whatever but instead of what she did was she wrote a devastating critique of artificial intelligence which is like wild because i mean copy machines were, were not artificial intelligence but what she found out is that the machine she took the machine to be an, an, a sort of a potential artificial intelligence system that would get into a conversation with the user and the machine and the user would be in a kind of conversation and what she showed was that everything we've just been talking about this whole idea of situated practices and how people can see each other in the space and see what other people are doing and how we can respond to each other and make sense of things together in action in an improvised way all of that stuff copy machines were pretty much completely not capable of doing any of that at all she showed that she always had two people working together uh, talking about making a, a copy and then the copy machine itself and she had she did conversation analysis which some of you may know if you do human media interaction in the program uh, with us at, in Twente there's a lot of people doing conversation analysis also researchers so you get also courses on that uh, which is very cool and if you do conversation analysis you have these um, uh, written out um, um, the literal uh, written out um, uh, conversations that people have but also with all the pauses and um and and and, and the turn taking and so on and, and the, the hesitations of people and she showed she showed that the, the people the two people working on the copy machine had like whole complex conversations about how how to make that copy like a difficult copy like like sizing it up and then double-sided a3 um, with an extra margin or something and then trying to do that on the copy machine which is really, like really difficult task and then she showed in a third column what the machine was thinking and what the machine was saying and how the machine was participating in the conversation and the third column was for page and page empty so she literally has pages in her in her thesis with empty columns for the machine the machine's participation in the whole conversation was zero like there would be nothing 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 and and the two people would be talking and talking and talking and trying to make sense of what how to do it and then when they opened the lid of the machine the machine would go like lid opened so that was the that was the only thing that the machine was participating to the whole conversation and she showed in that way that machines are not capable of situated practices at all they're they're not part of it they don't enter it in that way how they do enter it uh, is as a tool for human sense making right so we use machines as part of our uh, collaborative sense making as as these mediating objects that go they, we use it as a go-between between people right but the machine itself is not an intelligent agent contributing to the conversation at all anyway so that was sort of a side issue because we're not talking about artificial intelligence in this course uh, directly 
But uh, to get back to the idea of representation, um, as soon as we make external representations of our own practices, like we make a sketch or uh, we have a screen with information or data on it, uh, then this data will, as I just said, become mediating elements in our practices, right? So if, we, if, if I create a sketch and you and I are talking about an idea and I'm sketching it out and you point at the sketch and I see where you are pointing and then I add something to the sketch and you see where I'm adding something and you see that I saw what you're been, you've been looking at, this helps us understand each other and it helps us understand the task or the idea of what it is that we're doing, right? And an interesting example of that is also what we see now happening here in the COVID crisis. Um, on the left, you see a picture of what phenomenologically the COVID crisis would be for many of us. You you are in a space, you wear the hat cap, you see other people wearing mouth caps, um, um, you uh, get controlled, uh, or there, there's a, uh, somebody measuring your temperature and otherwise you cannot go through, you're not allowed to go somewhere and so on. So that's the everyday life experience of COVID. But then on our screens every day, we see also how many, um, uh, we see also the the numbers, right? And this, this is data that's being measured. It's mapped out. We see all kinds of maps and graphs and so on. And we see these on our screens and this starts to influence how we perceive the environment. So if we see in the data that things are very, very serious and we see then somebody walk with a mouth cap, this mouth cap becomes sort of a symbol of the seriousness of the situation for us. Right? But maybe if we see uh, numbers going down and we see somebody with a mouth cap, maybe we think like, oh, well, is that really necessary? And so on. Right? So how we perceive the everyday environment starts to become influenced by the representations that are part of our everyday practices. Right? And it's not the case that the representation, which is the picture on the right, is just simply an accurate um, model of the world. It's an active element in shaping reality, right? So the representation has a feedback loop back into reality. How we see the world in the representation starts to influence what we do, which in the end also, of course, starts to influence the data that get back into the map, right? So there's a double feedback loop there going on. And very often people are not aware of that because very often we only stop at the moment of thinking, oh, we have the reality and then we make a representation of it. We make a model, huh? we, we draw it in a graph, the data, and we stop thinking there. But drawing data in a map and then giving that back to people who are part of the, what the system that generates the data creates a feedback loop. That's, that's something that you really should understand. You are partly also influencing the data as soon as you give the map back to people. That is something to think about would be my idea of it, is that uh, these representations are never just used as statements about the facts. They're always part of social practice, but this immediately also means they're part of politics. And I don't mean big politics here, like in terms of the COVID crisis, it's big politics, right? So who should we believe and what is the interest of the government in, in deciding on the rules and so on and the economy and all that stuff. This is this statement, this text that I wrote here was from long before the COVID crisis. And this is just about in any, like if I draw a picture and I'm discussing with you an idea, then it's also always a little bit about you and me. It's not just about the idea. It's also that the fact that it's my idea that I'm drawing there. And if you suddenly take a marker and you put a cross through my picture, it's not just that you say that you don't like the idea. <clears throat> it's also a little bit like, hey, you're crossing out my idea, right? And, the, and this, so, so ideas are of people in, in practices, in settings. And I'm going to show you a little uh, video of that. Now, what you see in the video is that um, the, the picture that they, both these guys draw is the same picture. So why are they both drawing their own picture? Well, partly because they have a little bit of a fight over who is the most important guy in the room. So the guy on the right draws his own 
house and he draws it a little bit higher than the other guy and uh, the guy on the left actually was teasing the guy on the right in the beginning a little bit because he was saying oh I'm as a designer I would draw a sketch and then I give my pen to the user and then he offers his pen to his colleague but his colleague doesn't want to be the user right he's also a designer so he wants to be also the interesting and and, and important guy so he takes his own pen and then he starts to draw his own picture a little bit above the other guy's picture now all of that is of course a lot of anecdotal interpretation on my side of what is going on here but i do believe that these processes happen all the time and you cannot just shut them out so what what do i mean what i mean is there's a kind of power play here at work between people Whereas superficially speaking, they're just explaining to me how they should use, how they are using sketches in their everyday work as designers. But in reality, um, what also happens is that, that there's a little bit of competition between the two. And this happens all the time, right? So when people work with representations in social practices, there's this micro politics going on. People are positioning themselves and they're saying, here I am this is my idea i'm now sketching it out drawing it on the whiteboard so this also means it's not just a good idea it also means that i am a person that is noteworthy and that you should not just neglect or shove aside now there's one thing that i'm not going to talk about which is activity theory so i'm just going to mention it here and this is actually quite related but unfortunately we don't have time to put that into the lecture there's a great book acting with technology by victor captelin and uh, bonnie nardi um, so if you if you like that please have a look into that and finally the final thing that I want to uh, show now um, I don't actually know if there's a lot of there's probably literature on this but this is just an observation that I made uh, here again at a judo match I'm often at the judo matches uh, so this is a place where I start thinking about things um, so what you see here is the idea of perspective taking visualized in this photo that i took um, the two judo players are let's suppose that that is the main activity going on right the two judo players are having this uh, match they each have their own experience and perception of the situation which is about whether i'm winning or not and where i am in the action but probably they don't have much time to really step back from the situation and reflect on it and look at it like hey what's going on because if they really would do that they would look so they're just in the flow they're, they're in the flow of action and they're not thinking at all in a way they're just going with their embodied flow now the referee the guy in the in the black he's looking at that scene but he's looking at it from a certain perspective namely are these two people following the rules should i say stop should i say go uh, did one person win is that a correct throw and so on so the referee has a certain perspective now the people at the back here they are the help referees and the, and the and the people who make the scores they're also looking at it and they are forming a system as it were with the referee so they have a social they have a situated practice going on right here which is already in a way about so it's sort of representational of the main activity here which is the the actual fight right because they are mostly concerned with the rules with the boundary conditions within which this fight is taking place and the fact that this is on a on a square that you have to stay within the square makes this very explicit right um, they are setting the rules that, like th these guys here are sort of the extra borders that the the orange borders are very physical borders but there's sort of social borders here because he will shout stop if you go over the line over the the symbolic line right but also if you go over the actual red line he also says stop so that's all perspectives from the from the rules of the game now this girl here is the next one up she's looking at the game from an outsider's perspective slightly disinterested because she's not interested in this game she's only interested in seeing four more seconds and then i'm up so she's she's sort of preparing for a completely different activity but looking at the same thing same for these people here some of them are watching some of them are not watching 
this woman here is of course the mother of one of these boys here or girls i don't know if it's boys or girls and she is looking at the game with a completely different perspective being very interested and very very invested in the game i am another parent and these are not my kids so i'm looking at i'm i'm taking a photo of this whole scene and i'm looking at it from the perspective of a teacher in human computer interaction and design and embodied interaction who's thinking about that it would be maybe a cool picture for a lecture right so there's all these different perspectives of how people are looking at the scene and the point is that from the perspective that you take you guide your own actions so i'm not filming this because I'm not the parent. The parent is filming it. The referee takes certain actions from their perspective. If the referee would have a lunch break and stand here, uh, he would not take the same actions. So he would still be a referee, but he would not be sort of in the role of referee and so on and so forth. So everybody, everybody's behavior is guided and it's, and it's not something you have in your head. You, you are sort of situated in that role that you have and you look at the world from the role from the perspective that you have and from that perspective you take actions that are appropriate to your role like this guy here couldn't just walk on to there and start helping this guy uh, this kid, kid here win the game right that would be totally inappropriate but it's not like he has that in his head active all the time thinking oh i shouldn't help i shouldn't help because that's not my role no it's not that explicit it's just you sort of you grow into that and it's it, it's contextual and historical like this it's, it's because he came in and had that role and sit on that chair and so on that he's he would never think of uh suddenly starting to fight on the mat right so um this is just to say that a lot of what we do and how we see the world is dependent on the perspective that we have and this perspective is very fluid and changing all the time right i could be uh, I, I could be a passive observer and the next moment I could be the next runner-up and the next moment I would be there fighting on the mat. Mm -hmm.